<laughs> and we're off with uh, Reverend Jackson. Last week, remember, she had, there was an issue, but she's ready to go at this time. So, uh, Reverend Jackson, amen. The floor is yours. Thank you, sir. All right. Let's see here. We're going to share a screen. Um, can everyone see it? Yes, I not can, yet. I can see it. See it. If I take time for others, but yes. Okay. Um, my portion was the second half of uh, chapter eight, and it was on abortion. And uh, I uh, went and did some research and did some things and uh, found a lot of information. Um, the first uh, slide, as you can see, says abortion is one of the controversial issues discussed in medical ethics. Over on the side, um, you can see it says fetus as human being, where is the cutoff? Um, abortion and the effects of abortion. Um, the first screen I want you to has three different things on there. And I'm gonna talk about these three different uh, things. Um, uh, the first one says fetus has to be regarded as a human being. Um, number two, killing an innocent human being is morally wrong. And number three, abortion is an example of killing and terminating a human being's life. Um, according to proponents of, the abor of abortion, committing abortion is morally justified. There are some that uh, will justify abortion. In fact, one is permitted to abort the fetus during the pregnancy period whenever she wants. Uh, however, the opponents of abortion do believe that committing abortion is morally wrong. So you've got two sides. You've got one side that says that um, uh, abortion is morally justified. And then you've got the other side that says that it is morally wrong. So looking at that, um, to formulate the argument, we'll look at what the opponents say. And, and as I stated, the first three things was a fetus has to be regarded as an example of a human being. Killing an innocent human being is morally wrong. Um, abortion is an example of killing and terminating a human being's life. Um, some ethicists, uh, there are some ethicists who believe that taking into account the pregnant woman's rights um, and that's one of the controversies right now. Uh, they're talking about uh, the woman's rights. Uh, she is allowed to abort the fetus whenever she intends during the pregnancy period. Um, right now, they have a pill that a woman can take. Um, uh, she can be up to three months pregnant and she can take this pill and it will abort the baby. Um, according to them, this is a part of the woman's body, and if this is the case, the way she treats her body is generally justified. This is what some ethicists say. Um, but there's a dilemma. There are some who have been confronted with a dilemma. According to the first uh, uh, part of the uh, dilemma, the proponents have to subscribe to impeticide, which is the crime of killing a child within the first year of life which we know is morally wrong. Um, abortion statistics, I looked up some statistics, uh, current United States data. Uh, total number of abortions in the US um, in uh, uh, 1973 up until 2019, there were 62.4 million abortions. Um, US abortions in 2017, uh, you can see the number there. Abortions per day, um, abortions per hour, uh, one abortion every 37 seconds, and 13.5 abortions over a thousand women aged 15 to 44 in 2017. 
Um, there's 195 uh, abortions per thousand live births, according to the Centers for Disease Control. Um, scripture, it can be seen that the scripture uh, premise deals with the idea of harming others. Some of the proponents do not believe that harming others is wrong. From this, we are permitted to kill human beings in several contexts with some reservations. Um, in other words, and according with uh, their positions, committing abortions, which is an example of killing human beings, is permissible to some ethical contexts. They continue to go back, and 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 it's it's you can you can see it all over the world. They continue to go back to the woman's rights. Um, in Genesis, though, it explains that man is made in the image of God, which makes us special and makes us distinct from the rest of the created order. God man made man as the pinnacle of his creation. The Bible's account does not permit us to believe the deity was somehow poured into Christ's body. The plain truth is that Jesus was incarnated at conception. He was a zygote or a cell. And we know that women produce cells and men produce the sperm. Um, he was, he, God was fu fully a human. If there's a doubt that human life begins at fertilization, or if you regard the human embryo, embryo as a thing, then you have an argument with the scripture. Um, there are many sins that, Bible, that the Bible condemns implicitly or indirectly. For instance, the commandment thou shalt not kill certainly applies to sins such as serial killing, terrorism, and the indiscriminate bombing of civilians during warfare. Though these are not specifically mentioned in the Bible, how then may we know? And that's a question that, that you know, some of us need to ask. How then uh, may we know that the Bible indirectly condemns abortion? Uh, to begin, let's see here, with the Bible repeatedly uh, condemned, condemns the killing of innocent, uh, the sinless, Jeremiah 7 and 6 and 22, 17. These are the scriptures where you can find where um, the, it, it, you know, it talks about condemning the killing of, innocent, of the innocent. Uh, Psalms 106, 37 through 38, um, uh, Proverbs, Isaiah, Luke, and Matthew. Um, a preborn child is obviously, and we already know that, we all know a preborn child is innocent of any crime or actual sin uh, because he or she cannot possess the intent of doing evil. Um, pro-abortionists sometimes justify abortion by casting the preborn child in the role of an aggressor. This is illogical because aggression requires conscious intent. Okay. Second, um, the Bible teaches that human life created and nurtured by God is present in the womb of the woman from the very beginning. Um, it talks about this in Psalms 139, 13 through 15. Praise God. For thou didst from my inward parts, thou didst knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from thee. When I was being made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth, it goes on to say, furthermore, God personally named and honored seven men before they were even born. Uh, only persons merit names. These seven are Ishmael in Genesis 16 and 11, Isaac in Genesis 17 and 19, Josiah in 1 King 13 and 2, Solomon in 1 Chronicles 22 and 9, Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1 and 5, and John the Baptist. Uh, Luke 1 13 and Jesus himself in Matthews 1 and 21. Um, let's see. Third, all um, authentically religious people agree that God opens and shuts the womb 
and infuses the human body with a soul. Uh, there are more than a dozen biblical references referring to this. This means that God certainly intended to create a human life, and we have no right to interfere with his will regarding his creation. God does not act randomly or without reason. Despite what some abortion advocates allege, he creates every child for a purpose. Psalms 127 specifically refers to children as a gift of the Lord and as a reward. We do not have the right to dis disrupt or destroy his plans. Abortion is supremely arrogant, is a supremely uh, arrogant act because it imposes a creature's will or yeah, a creature's will over God's. In this, not the def is this not the definition of all the sins? stubbornly refusing to do God's will for our, our lives. Uh, finally, God is not inconsistent. He has loved us with an infinite love for all eternity, long before we were even conceived. Um, he said to us, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. And he, he says that in Jeremiah 31 and 3. If he values men, he named, he values all of his created preborn human beings. Um, scripture summarized. Um, as you can see here, uh, I wrote down some scriptures. Unborn babies are called children in Luke 1, 41 and uh, 44 and 2, 12 to 16. The unborn are created by God, Psalms 139 and 13. The life of the unborn is protected by the same punishment for injury or death in Exodus 21 and 22. Christ was human from the point he was conceived in Mary's womb. Matthews 1, 20, 21, Luke 1, 26 and 27 talks about that. The image of God includes male and female. The sex is determined at the moment of conception. Unborn children possess personal characteristics. Psalm 51 and 5 talks about that. Personal pronouns are used to describe unborn children. The unborn are said to be known intimately and personally by God. Um, the unborn, I see, sorry, the unborn uh, are even called by God before birth. Okay, during the prenatal uh, period, being a mother myself, the first month, the month of conception, that uh, um, the first three months, matter of fact, are very, very crucial in pregnancy. Um, all in the first month, all the human characteristics are there. The heart is pulsating or beating at the time, at this time, and this is when within the first three weeks. So his or her head, arms, and legs begin to develop. In the second month, the brain um, waves begin um, are, and they're detected. The nose, ears, eyes, and toes begin to develop. The embryo begins to develop a skeleton in the second month. Um, the embryo develop, develops his or her own unique fingerprints. Um, his or her, uh, they become sensitive to touch. And at this time, all bodily systems are developed and functioning. Prenatal period continues when the third month you begin feeling movement. The little one now has begun to swallow, squint and swim. He or she is now grasping their hands and can move their tongue. They are now able to even suck their thumb. At this time, they are able to feel organic pain. And then you go on to the fourth month um, there is a tremendous amount of growth. His or her weight increases six times. Um, and see, and the majority of abortions that take place is in the third or fourth month. Um, and that's sad because as you can see, as I'm explaining this, these are humans. These are babies. These are not things. Um, the fourth month, there is a tremendous about a, amount of growth. His or her weight increases six times. Her, hey, their growth, they grow up to eight to 10 inches long. Uh, 
they can even hear their mother's voice. Social evidence, um, with these characteristics, there's no doubt that the embryo is human from conception to birth. Um, in addition to the biblical and scientific evidence, there are many social arguments for protecting the human rights of the unborn. In conclusion, today, one largely accepted opinion is that until the 14th day from fertilization, or at least until implantation, the human embryo may not be considered from the ontological point of view as an individual. But to assure you, both scripture and science support the view that an individual life begins at conception. And both special and general uh, revelation declare it's wrong to kill an innocent human being. Thank you. Any amen. questions? That was, amen. That was very, very good. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Reverend Jack? I, I, she did a very good presentation. I'm, thank you for the visual uh, that you did as well. And as you were talking, I remember last week when um, Mrs. Rose did about um, how can you, and I asked her a question about consciousness, and you kind of answered that in the fourth month where a person can hear their mother voice. So I thank you. You did a very good job in your presentation. Thank you. Amen. Anyone else? Has a very informative. Very informative. Thank you for that. Amen. Amen. Okay, I do have a question. Um, and this yes. is to, and this is to everyone. This is not just to Reverend Jackson. Okay, so we I think pretty much most of Christendom agree when it comes down to an abortion. Uh, where I want to go at. Um, let's talk about miscarriage just for a second. Okay, and I think pretty much mostly everybody on here should understand what a miscarriage is. It's a really a terrible mishap. But I want to ask because I, I there are some that may not believe that a miss that there are there is times that a miscarriage can almost be an abortion. For instance, listen to this. Say that if a doctor tells a young lady that um there is a probability uh, of a miscarriage uh, after you continue to drink and smoke and um, you know, still doing this late night party, you need to be resting. Let's say that this young lady does not take heed to the doctor's advice. She continues to drink, continues to smoke, continues to party. So, um, so then let's say a few months later, she has a miscarriage. Is that a miscarriage or is that an abortion? Well, and uh, you can still call them um, uh, a miscarriage. I'm quite sure it still can be called a miscarriage because it happens all the time. But when a person intentionally, could it be possibly that some people don't want to have a baby and live a loose lifestyle, hoping that they'll have a miscarriage without having the title of an abortion? What say ye? I yes, it's possible. Yes. Yes, because they didn't take the responsibility of uh, preventing the safety of their child when they were given pre warning of what possibly could happen. And I, I think about that when I was, uh, both of my children, when I carried them, I could not work because I was told the way the baby said I could easily lose it. So I had to, could not work during those times. So I, I think if you don't take the time to take, heave to the advice and wisdom given to you uh preventing the, the life of that baby you could say that okay mm -hmm. uh, anyone else i agree you? oh okay. i agree too i think okay. it could be. i would yes. think basically we're dealing with mother rebellious society at this point especially dealing with young people so i wouldn't say it was so much an abortion as it was just a very part of rebellion not wanting to listen and take heed because i'm going to do what i want to do and this is the kind of attitude most times that we find with young people, younger, well, girls in their respect of what you're saying in that regard, where they don't believe that anything can happen. I'm having a good time. I'm enjoying it. My baby's having a good time, which is ignorance. So I wouldn't say it's outright abortion, but it definitely becomes a miscarriage. 
Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Pastor. Um, I want to ask, especially most of you ladies will probably know this more than, than men. Have you ever known anyone that pretty much you felt like intentionally lived a lifestyle uh, as though, and, and might have mentioned they didn't care if they lost a baby or not? Yes, um, I, I've seen it before. Um, more like so it's suicidal behavior where they're purposely trying to get rid of the baby, but they're doing it in a kind of like an undercover way, but it's still going to end up trying to kill the baby. Okay, and, and that's what I want to bring out. There are some people that will not go to get an abortion, but undercover, they will do everything they can not because of ignorance, not because of rebellion. They're really trying to get rid of the baby. And I've heard of this years ago. Um, and so I'm prayerfully that this is something that don't happen a, a whole lot. But um, let's say let's say that um, what happens if a person intentionally kills someone, um, what 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 the, is that legal term for that? What how could that person be charged? Premeditated, not premeditated. No, it'd just be murder, wouldn't it? No, I think it, it wouldn't be murder if they unintentionally killed them. Oh, it's manslaughter. 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 Man 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 okay, so if, if a person, uh, let's go back to the mother again, as she lives a life that is not uh, uh, pretty much according to what do the doctors say and all of that. Uh, it, does anyone know of any case where a father has taken his, his wife or his girlfriend to court because he felt like that that she's the reason why the baby's dead in this manslaughter? That's uh, if someone get a chance to, well, I'm going to Google it anyway. I'm going to see if there's a case of it in nature. But I wouldn't be surprised because I've seen fathers take their own uh, wives or girlfriend to court for various things, you know. Uh, just felt like that the mother wasn't fit, especially if, you, if, if the male wanted to have the baby, but she said, I don't want to have a baby, but the baby dies while she's pregnant. He's going to be really suspicious. He's going to be really suspicious. So, but that's just something to think about. So we're getting ready to move on now. Uh, but just, I just wanted to put that thought in your, in your mind that, uh, that abortion is, uh, can be done undercover as well. Um, and, but the, the fact, the difference is, at the end of the day, God knows the heart. So he, so you might have had a miscarriage, but he, God knows your heart. He knows that if you intentionally uh, caused that to happen, and he will judge you harshly. So, but let's move on. At this time, we have uh, Apostle uh, Melinda Beck. She is, uh, uh, we're going to give her the floor at this time. Apostle, are you with us? I see your microphone is off. Yes, sir. I'm here. Okay. Um, I am going to get on. Um, I had to. I was dealing with war, the ethics of war, and as I began to look at the ethics of war, I, I was taken back to scriptures. Give me one second. My notes here. So there were three questions that were asked at the beginning of the chapter. Those questions were: Which should a Christian attitude be um, when it comes to war. The second question was, is it ever right to take a life at another person under the command of one's government? And the third question was, is there a biblical basis for engaging in war? So when I begin to look at this, the, the first question I says, uh, what, what should a Christian's attitude between, be towards war? And be towards war. And the first thing that came to my mind was there's a season, uh, a proper time for everything under the sun. That being for war or of war, a time of war, a time of peace, Ecclesiastics tells us. Then the other, the second question was, is it ever right to take a life at another person, uh, of another person under the command of one's government? And that goes into our always, never, and sometimes. And number three was, is there a biblical basis for engaging in war? And the answer was yes. When I begin to look at number one, I looked at the scripture in Revelation that says, uh, it tells us that there was a time that there was a war in heaven. So understanding that war existed even before time even existed. And that that war that took place in heaven had spilled over into the earth realm. And Ephesians tells us that even, we don't even war against flesh and blood, but also against 
spiritual principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, and uh, high places, the rulers of the darkness um, against spiritual wickedness and high places even in the earth realm. So that brings in war into the earth realm. So what is war? War is a state of conflict between two or more generally armed entities. And with that being said, um, I was beginning to look at the first part when we said, is war ever, is it ever right to kill a life? So from the activist point of view, starting um, in war, I was writing down that from the biblical point, the Bible tells us that in Old Testament, God created government and to disobey government would mean to disobey God. So the first point is if something, if you disobey what God commanded, um, because God made government, if you discommit this, let me slow down. Um, if you disobeyed government, it was as if you were disobeying God. And then because God ordained human government, it was part of his permissive will because the, the children of Israel, they did not want an invisible God, they wanted a king. But in between there, we had to deal with the book of Judges and dealing with the book of Judges, we had to deal with a play, uh, an area of time where there was chaotic, but there was men that were in charge of trying to control some of the chaos that was happening during that transition where men were coming into kings. So it also talked about, um, I began to also look at what was made to protect the innocent from aggressors. Um, Mosaic theocracy says that an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But when we begin to look at the protection of the innocent, I was also looking at the scripture uh, and judges that had to deal with the concubine, the Levite whose concubine was raped he allowed to be raped in place of him being attacked by those that were homosexual at the time. So when this happened, he left that woman to die on the doorstep after they had finished her, beating her all, all that night, slept with her, raped her, left her in the door. Was it the right time to go to war to protect that one who was innocent? So the Benjamites were in war because of what happened with this one person that was there. Is it right? That they that they that the all of the rest of the tribes of Judah went to war behind the, the rape of this one woman. We're supposed to be protecting those that are innocent. Um, in the New Testament, Jesus honored the request of the government authority. He tells us to honor the request of government when he says, "Give Caesar what is due to Caesar." Um, when Jesus came to Pilate, he said, "All power." is given by government through God. It goes on in Romans to say divine establishment. Uh, Romans 13 tells us that divine establishes man is to submit to the authority and not to rebel against it. Ruling authority uh, as a ruling authority as the servant or agent of God, which means whoever's in control of government, whatever that king is, whoever uh, that ruling authority is, that they're acting as an agent of God. The power of government to take human life is ordained by God. And this is what activism says. I'm sorry, my, my page is acting crazy. So I do apologize. So basically what activism was saying that, that there is a time in which we should be going to war. So to protect the innocent, there should be, we should go to war for that. There are times where there are situations where our standards and morals are under attack. And that was a time that we should go to war and that it was approved by God for us to do that because he is the one who is demanding that. Um, and that is from a, a, the biblical argument for war. So again, God created government. And if government tells us to go to war, that we should go to war. If we disobey government, we're disobeying God. God ordained human government. Therefore, it was his permissive will for them to be in charge. War was made to protect the innocent from aggressors. The Mosaic theory says, again, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. New Testament, Jesus says, honor the request of government. Uh, Jesus referenced, again, Pilate and saying all power is given by God. 
So therefore, to kill is right. Um, Romans, again, I'm repeating it because I want to make sure it's clear. In Romans 13, divine establishment, God, again, establishing government, man is to submit to authority. The ruling authority uh, is acting as the servant or the agent of God to punish wrongdoers. The power of government is to take human life as ordained by God. So to, to persecute wrongdoers, to execute those who do wrong. So from a phys phys philosophical argument side, Plato's dialogue, Preto, government to, uh, is, is as if it's man's parent. Government acts as a parent. And that if you disobey your parent, that it was dishonorable. And in disobeying your parent, you don't disobey your parent because your parent invested in you and giving you life. So it's saying the government is like a parent who has prepared to give you life. And it has prepared this by putting systems in place like healthcare systems, like putting clinics in place, like putting um, like the par parental centers in place for you to come into the earth. Then it talks about the government of um, the government is man's educator. So after you get here, the government is responsible for your educating for your education. It is responsible for teaching you right and wrong. It is responsible for making you who you are is basically what it was saying. And then it says, it is the duty that you obey the government because of this, that there is a demand put on you because quote unquote government made you in a sense. Without government, there would be, there would be chaos. So Plato was saying that because you live in a certain government or in a certain state, that they're protecting you. So you must go to war if they tell you to go to war because you owe the government that for protecting you, for, for giving you education. And there would be chaos and you would have been born in chaos and, and, and ignorant if it wasn't for government. So therefore you should go to war if government tells you to go to war. To go to war. Socrates um, said that the governed have the duty to obey. So he's saying, because you live in a certain state and you're in that certain territory, it is your job to obey the laws of that land. Then he says, if you don't like it, leave. That's, the, that's your way out of it, is to leave. And so you won't have to go to war or do what government says. But without government, there would be social chaos. So basically, in a nutshell, to disobey government is like a disobeying God. So pacifism, war is not right regardless. So biblical arguments is basically throughout, there's a repetitiveness of you shall not kill, whether intentionally, that intentionally taking a life is murder and it's wrong across the board. No matter how it's done, no matter what, for what reason it's done, it's all wrong. And that Jesus said that we're not to resist evil. So he talked about turning the other cheek. So we're supposed to take whatever happened turn the other cheek, we're supposed to stand that there is no place where we should go against what is biblically said, that killing is killing and, and that's the bottom line. So philosophy was saying that, he was saying that basically, philosophically, I'm sorry, it was basically saying that if you kill someone intentionally, that, that there are consequences for it. I'm going back, I'm sorry. That there would be consequences for it. So uh, again, God says that there should not be any war. There shouldn't be any war. There should not be any argument against what God has told you to do. Okay. And pacifism says that, that if you're in a neighborhood and you see a person doing wrong, that you're still supposed to be, you have to weigh whether it's right to go to war, whether it's right to attack. It's like, it's like a person being in a neighborhood. And if you see something wrong being done, that do you decide whether you're going to interfere or not, or do you call the authorities? It was basically pretty much on that. And, and then skepticism, selecticism, sorry.
I'm sorry, my computer messed up. So I'm trying to find my notes. <laughs> So selectivism says that it's it, it it's a time to go to war. There's a time not to go to war. So again, I, I went back to the scripture that says that about the Benjamites. There was a time for them to go to war. Um, there was a time for Israel, Judah, to go to war against the Benjamites because it was against the more character and the more values of what they what Israel stood for. Going back into that again, looking at what happened with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they would not bow, they would not, they would do the right thing regardless of, of the situation against it. So there's always a time to do what's right and a time not to do what's right. So there's a time for war, there's not a time for war. And even looking up the word war, when I looked at the etymology of the word war, there was a, uh, they talked about chaos and confusion, but then there was another piece that it talks about being beautiful. So again, there's that beauty and evil. Is, is the blood running in the street worth it or not? Um, we talked about having a time of peace, but peace often comes with war. Okay, you're done? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, okay. My my computer went crazy, so I'm pulling pieces from places. I okay, praise apologize. God. Okay, amen. Praise God. Thank you, Apostle. Uh, does anyone have any questions, comments, or statement uh, for Apostle Beck uh, at this time? Very good. Yes, I want to say very good. It, it it was very informative. Thank you so much for, um, you know, everything that you shared. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Question, comment, or statement for Apostle Beck? I thought she did an excellent job. You still did a good job, even in spite of your computer. Thank you. you know, it's like going crazy over here. I'm so sorry. Okay. Amen. <laughs> but I just wanted to, you know, that, that was the main thing. Again, deciding when is a good time to go to war? Is a life, is there ever a good time to take a life? Because that loss, somebody's going to emotionally pay for it. And, and you can't measure that. A lot of times we talk about war being... Due to greed, people wanting territory, people wanting land, people um, just wanting money, the love of money being the root of all evil, uh, the things that people want to possess. But is it worth it? Is it worth the blood running in the street? In cases like that versus the time when you're trying to get peace, is it, is it worth going to war then? You know, and I especially got stuck on in judges because of the fact that here's a woman who was with her husband her husband just threw her out to be beaten and abused and he cut up her body and he sent it to to all the tribes so the rest of the tribes came up against that because that was such a gruesome act that was performed against a person and when we talk about war you talk about two combative bodies at each other but in war we're supposed to protect the innocent um uh, and it brought me back to a lot of you ever watch any of the old medieval um, films when they would they would kill the men, but the men would go out, but they would protect the women and the children. All in the old westerns, even when they went to to houses in the middle of civil war, they they didn't bother the women and the children. They might have ate their food, they might have stole their cattle, they might have stole their horses, but there was a sense of protection even in war. So it was a lot of interesting things. And I did. Amen. Very good job. I Amen. enjoyed it. Thank Amen. You. Very good. Now, for those that may not know, uh, those that's here to send the Bible one, uh, we just we just did a study on that. Um, in Judges, the 12th chapter, the 22nd verse. So I would encourage everybody to write that down and look at that story because it's quite a bit there. Judges 12, 22. Um, again, it's the, it's the second time in biblical history where uh, sodomites, again, attempt to, again, take a man instead of a woman and get mad because they can't have the man. <laughs> so, uh, so, again, Sodom and Gomorrah is not the only time we, again, where uh, sodomy is, is an issue. But this story here is, is really gross. And... Again, as she brought out so eloquently, uh, 
that it was a moral issue. This was not so much a legal issue. This was a moral issue. And if I recall this correctly, the children of Israel went before God before they attacked Benjamin. They went before God and asked God for permission to go to war. So that should tell us a lot <laughs> right there that God gave them permission, even though they lost the first two battles. But God okay. gave them permission you know, okay. to, to go. So it, it says a whole lot. I believe that God expects men. Uh, to protect their family and to protect their country by all means. So, and another uh, situation is like the Maccabees. The Maccabees, yes. the war that took place with the Maccabees, here they're protecting again their more values on the Sabbath day. And the, the Romans would come and they would kill all of them on the Sabbath day because no one would fight because of their, their, their belief in not doing anything on the Sabbath. So there had to be raised up leaders within the Jew, the Jewish tribe that said, look, we're not gonna take this anymore. It's not worth killing all of our family to protect the Sabbath day. Which one is the greater sin, protecting the, not doing anything on the Sabbath or protecting our family? Amen, very good point. Amen. I think Go ahead, Pastor. Dr. Dr. Short. Uh, pa excuse me, uh, 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 Sister Thelma. Uh, uh, Pastor uh, Tasha was getting ready to say something. Yes, um, I yes, Dr. Short. I think that war is very important. Um, when I think back on what happened with David and his men in the camp, uh, when the uh, their enemies came in, took all the women, and they pretty much took them away and had them hostage. And then David went and prayed, and he said, "Okay, let's go back and get our our women." And they went back and they fought and they took all the women back. So I think that 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 was the act of vindication. It is very necessary for protection. So um, especially regarding, you know, protecting their family and things like that. Amen. Awesome. Um, and uh, Sister uh, Thelma Bell. I, I was looking at the fact between when you was the uh, the South was fighting against the Northern states who free the slaves. I was thinking more in terms of that when it was necessary. Amen. 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 And I think sometimes people become so super spiritual and know every good thing that everything is going to be done by getting down on your knees. And while you're down your knees, somebody cutting your head off. You know. now, God expects, uh, I mean, from Genesis to Revelation, you see a uh, war. He expects men to do. Because at the end of the day, we're a spirit, you know, um, and, and we're, we're going to live in heaven or we're going to live in hell. Uh, but um, it, it's totally justifiable throughout. There's no way that we can deny it when we constantly see men asking God permission to go to war from Samson to God give me strength. And he killed thousands more people in his death than he did in his life. So uh, uh, that that is a very good one. Okay, we have one more to do. And all these are master students right now working on their doctorate so far that we're hearing from. And the last uh, but not least, again, I got him down as Dr. Norman Davis. Okay, he um, um, I had missed his turn because he was early on uh, because he had lost in his family, but he's here again. And uh, Dr. Norman is... Uh, you're all, you're up. Good evening, everyone. Unqualified absolutism. The question I am posed about the justification of lying, and if it really is any, as Christians, is this question was asked, the majority would all be saying lying is not ever justified as well as now we are Christ-like in nature. So as I approach the argument of Augustine against lying, his position is telling the absolute and that there's no real room absolutes cannot be broken. According to Augustine, even lying would save lives as, as in the case of Rahab, who did hide three Hebrew men, lied about her, their whereabouts that she hid them in the roof of her house so Augustine insists lying is strictly forbidden. To me, I find an insensitivity when it comes to the case of rape. To imply that a lie to keep a woman from being violated by a predator by forbidding her disclosure, even if you know where she is, by which Augustine's position saying is lying would, it would weaken the Christian faith. For if we are untruthful in one area, that from that point on, once we tell one untruth, from then on, everything else would be untruthful or doubtful. 
So now I explore the possibility of deceptions that a lie if done for the gain of many rather than for the loss of more. With the story where Rebecca used her son Jacob to deceive his father Isaac as pretending to be his brother Esau to obtain his birthright blessing. However, this was the fulfillment of what God spoke to Rebecca. So as written in Genesis 25 and 23, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in the womb and one and two manner of people shall be separated from their bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other and the elder Esau shall serve Jacob younger. However, if lying is never justified, how can we justify the fulfillment of what the Lord told Rebecca? It was fully carried out by a lie perpetrated by her as well as carried out by whom God chose to be the patriarch of the 12 tribes of Israel. Yet Augustine says some moral acts are intrinsically good, and hence their violations can never be of good purpose. Yet the deception of Jacob to his father Isaac ended for a good purpose, which had to fulfill the promise God made to his grandfather Abraham, as being coming the father of many nations, who also found himself lying for the sake of his wife, being his sister to a king, of which was a half-truth in order to save his life. Now concerning Jacob, Augustine and his unqualified absolutism is that Jacob was not being deceptive but obeying his mother's bidding. So are we to say that if a mama said then to Bill to tell the bill collectors when they call, close your eyes and say, I don't see her at that time. I would contend even though it is not a lie, but it also implies she is not at home. Augustine's position was that Christians ought not to lie to expose liars. In short, committing one sin to avoid another is still a sin. Augustine concludes that since eternal life is lost by lying, neither should a lie be told for the preservation of temporal life of another. In short, why lose eternal life to save a temporal life. However, Immanuel Kant favored a canatorial deontological ethnic that he based his ethics upon rules. Rather, lying or murder is wrong based upon what based upon that we should treat each other as a never an end and never a means to an end. Meaning, if lying were a, was a universal rule, then there would be no more truth to lie about. Therefore, it would be self-destructive to lie. For that, the categorical demand is that whatever cannot be universal, then we should never do it. That is, we should never kill. But by doing so, there would be rain, would remain no one else to kill. Kant's defense of universal moral duties implies by him for his unqualified absolutism are duty centered or better known as deontological. Moral duties are intrinsic. It comes from what inside of us, not extrinsic. From the influence of outside oneself, whatever is intrinsically good cannot be evil. It would be absurd to call a good act or deed evil, as it is called light darkness. Moral duties, Kant says, are by their nature admissions, no exceptions, to imply any moral law would indicate that it was never any, it was not, not ever any rule. He further expresses that moral duty is intrinsic, not extrinsic. So therefore, whatever is insurance equally good cannot be evil. Only what is neither good nor bad in itself, but dependent on something else for its goodness or evil can be called evil at one time and good at another. For example, an adult being for example, as they have to be in parents, we tell our children lying is wrong. Yet also out of that same mouth, we tell them an outright lie, which brightens up their face, puts a twinkle in their little eyes about a guy called Santa Claus who brought them lots of toys. That in itself is not evil. Yet it seems good to tell them that at that age. But here's where that good evil, that good turns to evil deed not intentionally, but by default. Because as they become older, they realize that it was a lie, but with good intent. 
even though it came from the most trusted individual in their life, their parents, they believed it. But now as Christians, you ought to, you want to present to them an invisible Jesus, which in fact, since telling the truth is an intrinsic good and a lie is an intrinsic evil in itself, there could never be a good lie. We might view that type of lie as mediocre. However, Hamlet Alec expresses this as, call, as conflicted absolutism. Since lying is a sin in the conflict situation, sin in itself is unavoidable. For we constantly fall into sin in borderline situations. In conflict absolutism, we find ourselves in this fallen world in compromising situations between divine requirements by God and what is permitted by law in this fallen world. This brings about conflicts of our duty to perform moral conflicts. But in conclusion, since God is absolute, this means of this end are found in Romans 3 and 4. Let God be true, but every man a liar. And that is my conclusion. Wow. Okay. Anyone, question, comment, or statement? Thank you, Dr. Davis. Okay, I kind of expected it for this one, put all those words into it. Okay. Um, uh, the only thing I brought up now, I, I just wanted everyone to make sure we're clear on um, the, the viewpoints of what uh, Apostle Davis was giving was that of various authors and not he himself. Uh, uh, one was Augustine, another was Hamlet. I'm not sure if that was a third person that he was quoting or not, but uh, but the, but Emmanuel those Kant. said again, Emmanuel Kant. Emmanuel Kant. Okay, so those are viewpoints again, uh, some uh, somewhat opposing one another, but again, uh, but the Bible let a man be fully persuaded of his own mind. Okay, so uh, and we're gonna leave it right there. So I I. I think that we are done with this. This has been one of the most rigorous classes, rigorous classes that we had, but it's been very informative. I've, I've learned a lot myself. Uh, I encourage you to continue to study on ethics and morals because we deal with it on a daily basis. We deal with it uh, a lot of time uh, unbeknown to us that we're dealing with a moral issue. And so, um, I, I, you need to finish out especially the um, the ebook that you have. We're not going to go into it now, but I want you to again to consider uh, finishing uh, these books out. Con consider uh, studying them. Now I do want to talk. This is our last class. Now what I this is what I need to do to get you guys a grade. I really need. Um, I, I was saying a few days, I'm going to need more than a few days. I'm going to need probably at least a week because I really want to listen to most of you guys again. And let me tell you why, because we're not, we're not doing a test. And um, what I need to do is listen to your presentation. Look at the papers you guys sent, you guys sent me. Uh, I'm doing one or the other or both. And I want to make sure that you did as I asked, and that was to give me a summary. I want to see how much of it, how much of it you did. You did your research, uh, especially Reverend Jackson. I know what you presented definitely wasn't in the book, so you had to do some serious research on that because I want us to learn how to do a summary. I want us to learn how to take what the author says and put it in our own words. We got to master that. We want to really learn how to uh, become professors and doctors ourselves and, and, and constantly um, um, being able to have your own insight, your own opinions, your own revelation. But everybody from this point, I, I, from, I see done uh, real well. I just, I just don't know where you're getting an A, A minus, or B, uh, or B plus. I'm just, I, that's what I need to fine tune this. So please give me some time. Now, I do want to say, uh, I do want to meet, um, I, actually, the last four people that spoke. I will say this. Um, everyone that's getting your master's, I'm going, I'm not master, going towards your doctorate, uh, 
that you have your master now. You're going towards your doctor and access all the your the last four speakers tonight. I'm not sure if we're and um, I, I know who's not on here. Apostle Shannon's not on here. She's not. She is. Not. Okay. I'm missing one. Okay. So even though he have his doctor, he's going for a doctor on a higher level. That's 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 what's going on with him. Okay. So um so I need to meet with you guys. If it's possible tomorrow night, I need to meet with you guys. Is it possible? Will everybody be free for about 10, 15 minutes tomorrow night? Uh let's say seven o'clock. About 10. I'm talking just to the master students. I just oh, want to yes. yeah. have a clubhouse at eight o'clock. Okay, Apostle Beck, um, uh, Reverend Jackson, Mother Rose, would you guys I'm be fine with that? Okay, yes, yes. I, I need to speak with you guys um, um, tomorrow. Um, let me see. Pastor Teller, where are you at? Remind me, please. I'm at my master. I'm, I finished the master's. Okay, okay. So I need you tomorrow night, okay, to be here at seven o'clock. I need to talk with all you guys, um, and um, we'll um, go on from there. Um, and I will be talking with everybody else soon because we have a graduation coming up in June. Now, most of you that's going for your doctor probably won't be graduating with your doctor until uh, uh, probably uh, November. I think June is too early for most of you, but. Um, but it should be this year if you continue to double up. Most of you are doubling up on your courses. So um, so that's pretty much it. Now, the only other thing is next Monday, we're not, we're not taking a break. Next Monday, we're coming, we're starting this class um, at seven o'clock. And the, that course is becoming um, naturally supernatural. I will be your teacher for that at seven o'clock. Some of you will... Um, be taking uh, Wednesday's class, and that class will um, be um, pretty much understanding the power anointing of, of a doorkeeper, which is the first of its kind. And both these courses were especially um, become natural, supernatural. This has been a course that's been with the National School of Theology, oh my God, probably 10 years. And I've been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. Uh, and so finally, uh, because if you go on the website, you're going to probably see it there. It's been there for years, but I've never taught it. Uh, but this is going to be the first time teaching that. So it may be a little challenge. We'll see, but I'm really looking forward to bringing, uh, bringing that out naturally, supernatural. Uh, so if you need the book, it's on Amazon. You need to have that by next Monday, 7 o'clock. Uh, this is a mandatory class for, again, all of you that are especially going for your doctorate. Um, now, if you guys um, need to work out a payment plan, if you want to do two courses, please get in contact with me. Um, we're trying to get, uh, I think just about everybody is pretty much caught up. Um, so, but let me know. Now, Wednesday night, the class is six o'clock, not seven. It's six o'clock Wednesday night, not seven o'clock. So put that down. Wednesday's class, the second of March is at six o'clock so is that five central time yes okay thank you uh-huh um now if, if anybody missed hermeneutics we are doing a hermeneutics class on thursday at five o'clock <laughs> so i got seven six five that's five o'clock right here on Zoom. If you miss hermeneutics and haven't had it and you want it and you need it, well, that's five o'clock. You need to be here for that. Or you can still, any course that I've taught, you can still more likely do a home study and get that, get that done. Because you cannot graduate with the National School of Theology without taking hermeneutics is one of our foundational courses. Bible one is one of our foundational courses. Um, so uh, those are courses that you have to have under your belt. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. If there's any last question, comments, or statement, guys, you all you all did awesome. I really didn't have any uh, challenging questions. I think you guys were very thorough uh, and all. Um, I, I do want to ask this. Uh, I, I, this is, I wrote something down off Apostle Davis's um, uh, teaching here. 
uh, because they were talking about lying as though I'm not sure who said it was it Hamlet or Augustine and talked like because of one sin uh, that God condemned. I'm just paraphrasing. And um, so, and I, I think we already went over this and maybe I don't even really, that's why I probably didn't answer it. But my personal belief is this, and we're gonna leave it at that for right now, um, that if a person tells a lie, uh, I think one of the things that was left out a lot by a lot of them is the mercy uh, of God and the forgiveness of God. That whether it's lie or any other sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You don't want to throw out, the, you throw the person totally out because of one lie. You know, where does the mercy and the grace of God? If that person repent, I, I believe that 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 God throws that sin to the sea of forgiveness. And uh, but I, I, but you, hey, you do something today, people still remember. That's people, but they don't have a head of hell to put you in. So I, I, I kind of disagree with uh, a couple of those guys. I'll be the F a person does lie. It's not the end of the world. I don't believe that once a person, if a person tell a lie, that I'm going to start judging everything they say because of one, especially because uh, I also want to know the motive of why that told. I, I agree that there is no good lie, but sometimes people tell a lie for a good motive, even though a lie is still a lie and it's still wrong. And so but we're not going to reteach this thing again. But um, so so that was pretty much it. And the only other thing I wrote down, uh, Apostle Davis, was uh, sometimes people make a difference between a lie and a deceit. Like I think you read in, in your story, you mentioned where someone says uh, if a, a person comes to the door, uh, just close your eyes and no, I don't see my mother, but the eyes are closed. But they didn't tell a lie. But again, but that's still deceit. A, a deceit is the cousin of a liar. So, so both of them are so bad. So, and that's why the Bible said God's gonna judge the heart because you can fool man, but you'll never fool God because He judges the, the heart. So, everyone, you did excellent. And so, we will, um, I can see you again next Monday night at seven o'clock. Becoming naturally supernatural. And uh, don't forget our meeting tomorrow night, all you masters guys. All right, uh, let us close out in the word of prayer. Father, Dr. Lord, Short. Yes. I'm sorry. The doorkeeper, is there a book for that one? Yes. I put, yes, it's called um, Open Heaven by Tommy Tenley. T Tommy, T O M M Y. And Tenley is T-E-N-N-E-Y, open heaven. And then the, the, the subword on that is a secret power of a doorkeeper. And I don't think I've ever heard nobody teach this before. Um, I, matter of fact, both these poor songs, I, I'm not, I know that some have taught, um, and uh, Apostle Davis taught something similar to this. He talked, I think, was walking in the supernatural. Um, but this is different. Um, so... Um, we're going to um, hopefully, yeah, you want to order that book because that's the Wednesday night class. That's generally the class that you're in. Yes, as well. Okay, saints of God, uh, let's close on a word of prayer. Father, right now in Jesus' name, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness. We thank you for those that spoke on tonight. God, we ask that you will continue to encourage them, strengthen them. God, we thank you, God, for all of our students all across this nation, New York, New Jersey, dear God, even in the South, Mississippi, dear God, uh, Texas. God, we ask that you continue, uh, Iowa, dear God, continue to move by your spirit. Bring us all together as one. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, saints. Amen. amen. God bless amen. you all. Have a great